year 1941, he emerged phoenix-like out of the ashes and smoke of the second great fire of London. It was a deliberate attempt by Germany to burn out the heart of the British Empire. In the blazing hell of Hitler's making, the men of our firefighting services lived, died, and won immortal glory. Early in the year came pictures of the birth of a naval giant. I named this ship Duke of York. May God bless her and those who sail in her. For all the attention of Goering's Luftwaffe, Britain was completing and discharging her shipbuilding program. What poignant memories are stirred by these pictures of the ever-to-be-remembered Ark Royal. Since the first days of the war, she was the special target of Germans and Italians alike. She was a scourge to the enemy right up to the end. And how they delighted to sink her by propaganda. Born 1938, she died gloriously on active service at the age of three. During the time when Mr. Everyman and his family went below Earth every night, a friendly American came over to get to know us. I never saw such spirit as I've seen in the people where I've been around this evening. You're great. Mr. Wilkie, ambassador of goodwill, was received by the king before returning to his country. American history was made as Mr. Roosevelt took the presidential oath for the third time. Will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. After an absence of five years, Haile Selassie returned to Abyssinia. Britain fulfilled her first promise when Mussolini's stolen empire was handed back to the emperor of a now liberated people. Once again, the red, green, and gold flag of Ethiopia was unfurled as the fascist reign of bondage drew to an end. Haile Selassie came home again. From the equator to the Arctic Circle, where Britain struck at the Lofoten Islands and mopped up Quislings and Nazis alike in a daring and highly successful raid. In one lightning thrust, we carried them off as the raiding parties set about the destruction of industries, factories, shipping, and petrol storage tanks which the Germans had stolen for their own use. A splendid piece of work by the Army and Navy, which dealt Hitler a stinging blow. Then across the Atlantic, President Roosevelt put his signature to the historic Lease and Lend Bill, America's first bullet at Hitler. Her bombshell came with the signing of the Anglo-American Agreement, whereby she exchanged destroyers for naval bases in the Atlantic. Closer and closer were being welded the two great democracies. These were Italian warships before Mussolini's fleet was smashed to pieces at the Battle of Matapan. Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham sailed in and planted the white ensign on Italy's doorstep. Easter ended and London again suffered the fury of Hitler's bombers. Another wild, indiscriminate orgy of destruction. For seemingly endless hours, the horrible scream of bombs and roar of flames went on. The blood, the sweat and tears that Nazi warfare feeds on. Shining brightly in the Mediterranean, Malta. The little military hothouse was setting an example of high courage to the world as almost without interruption, her buildings and homes were bombed without mercy for weeks on end. Her 500th raid was soon reached, but the valiant Maltese withstood their ordeal, and now the total runs into four figures. Once again, the hungry fires released by German raiders roared through the streets of London. But 33 bombers were shot out of the skies on that night when Rudolf Hess parachuted himself into Britain, Hitler's shadow and champion of the double cross. Another tragic blow was suffered by our expeditionary force and imperial troops when Greece and Crete were lost after one of the most heroic struggles in the annals of war. It was yet another bitter lesson which taught us more about paratroops and Tommy guns. Another glorious page in naval history was written when a host of British warships avenged the sinking of HMS Hood by chasing down and destroying the Bismarck. Admiral Somerville aboard Renown and vessels from the western Mediterranean to the North Atlantic spun an ocean web in which to trap the radar. Spotted first from the air, the Bismarck was encircled and brought to battle. A cine camera recorded part of the engagement. With her torpedoes, Dorsetshire sank the Bismarck. For the fourth time, Era was forcibly reminded by the Nazis that there's a war on. Dublin was bombed and the Era government complained to Berlin. 
a huge joke to Berlin. In the middle of the year, Germany invaded Russia. Every citizen in the Soviet prepared for the most colossal war in history. Her industries were geared up, and throughout the Union, women went to work making the weapons to meet the oncoming Nazis. Russia's millions were mobilized. Along a front extending nearly 2,000 miles, the mechanized might of the two biggest armies in the world clashed in deadly combat. Hitler's suicidal plan to crush the USSR before turning back to attempt the destruction of Britain had begun. In Syria, where British and Vichy French troops had come to grips, came the eagerly awaited armistice. As the peace treaty was prepared, the order to cease fire halted gunners in the act of loading. Great Britain and free France now guard the security of Syria until the day when France will rise again. And then to this war-ravaged world came news like a refreshing breeze from across the Atlantic. Mr. Churchill and President Roosevelt met on the high seas for the first time to draw up the historic Anglo-American agreement. It was aboard the ill-fated battleship Prince of Wales that these momentous pictures were taken. Yet another great and lasting link between the two nations was forged by the world's leaders of democracy. In the midst of a hideous war, we and America made plans for a new and happier world. As the ruthless Nazi war machine plowed its way into Russia, German propagandists were busily photographing every detail of its progress for exhibition in neutral countries. We intercepted those films. To the distorted Nazi mind, these pictures of the revolting atrocities they perpetrate and the heart-rending grief of bereaved women were intended to reveal the invincibility of German might. Today, Russia is giving her answer. For the second time, British troops struck out at a Nazi-exploited island. Spitsbergen was taken over, and the entire population evacuated to prepared homes in Britain. Systematic demolition of every industry was then carried out. Germany's Arctic storehouse was dynamited and set on fire. Coal mines were set alight, leaving the flames to burn deep into the pits and mountains of coal far into the long Arctic night. Spitsbergen became an island monument to the spirit of sacrifice for freedom. More history was made in Moscow when Mr. Avril Harriman for America and Lord Beaverbrook for Britain were met by Sir Stafford Cripps as they arrived in the Soviet Union to sign the Three Power Pact of Mutual Assistance. From that day onwards, British and American weapons of war fought on the Eastern Front. In this war where islands mean so much, Iceland made headline news. American troops took over its guardianship from our forces there, participating still further in this war which they were so soon to enter. One of the first effects of our all-out aid to Russia plan was the immediate influx of war materials into Iran for transport to the Soviet via the Iron Road running from the Persian Gulf to the Caspian Sea. Much of the help we promised Russia traveled to our allies over the mountainous route which cuts a tortuous path across the ancient land of Persia. With cyclonic suddenness, America was precipitated into the war when Japan altered the name of the Pacific by raining death and destruction on American bases there. Every continent and sea on this planet is now engulfed in war. America's western seaboard faces a threat of invasion by the treacherous little yellow men. As allies, Britain and America resolutely face the crowning infamy of 1941. Throughout the year, the fortunes of war in Libya swayed to and fro. After losing all we had won in Cyrenaica, we were set the task of exterminating the Axis forces in North Africa. The second battle of the desert had to be a decisive one. Goering's planes had to be swept from the skies. They were. The men from the British Empire saw to that. Rommel's panzer divisions had to be annihilated. The fading year sees their death struggles. Britain has delivered a smashing blow to the German army. And by the grace of God, we face the new year with a great victory to our credit. For the first time in this war, Germans in Africa and Germans in Russia are facing out-and-out -out defeat. Across the Atlantic and the Pacific looms America. Magnificent in the maelstrom of war, the USSR, the heroic nation of the Orient, China, and the determined peoples of the British Commonwealth of Nations will together break that cursed emblem and ride the storm to victory!